Welcome, everybody. This is the Life Enthusiast Online Radio TV Network, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. I'm your co-host, Scott Patton, and joining me as usual, Martin Patella, our life coach. Yeah, it's it's here for him and it's here for me. We'll see who gets through the recording right. <laughs> uh, it, you know, I feel bad that, you know, that there is not a genie in the bottle that you could just rub, get three wishes. And one of the wishes would be always young, healthy, vibrant, and no problem. And I wish that all the things that grew out of the earth and all the things that we sprayed on it were not toxic. But unfortunately, some things that grow are toxic and some things that we throw on them are toxic. And I wish that the factories didn't spew out crap like the power plants that burn coal and we get tons and tons, billions of tons of mercury thrown into the air, which of course we know is really, really good for us because we stick it in our bodies all the time with a uh, little needle. I don't want to go there. But, you know, oh, and then, I mean, this. Uh, but as soon as you start talking about any of these things, there's an uproar of you're being judgmental, you're being this, you're being that. Like, yeah. I'm sorry, you know, like, I saw it today. I saw it today on the forum, you know, the group that we manage. Somebody spoke up against sun tanning. Like there oh. was a question, hey, when I go to a tanning session, I actually feel better afterwards. Right? And I replied to it, well, that makes sense because it releases vitamin D3 and vitamin D3 is anti-inflammatory. So if you indeed are vitamin D3 deficient, and this brings it in, you get better. Mm -hmm. And and somebody else jumped on it and was quite mm, strong in wording, saying, don't do it. It's bad. Right? Yes. And, uh, and truth, yes, some people have gotten skin cancer. Yes, there's there's was a lot of controversy about tanning salons and should you go in and shouldn't you? And of course, the people that were abusing it and, or addicted to it, I don't know how how else to put it. Some of them ended up having some problems with it. Yeah, but and yet we're all different. Yet, I think. <laughs> sorry, Scott. Yet I believe we're built for a life in a savanna somewhere. Our ancestors ran nearly naked in open country daily right hunting and gathering that was in a tropical in a tropical area uh, like not the yeah. antarctic or the arctic where the sun is like not that strong perhaps right yeah yeah so well i mean the africans are especially built for that right the our ancestors that did better in the northern climates are the ones who lost the pigmentation right like you and i our ancestors are the Europeans who lived somewhere between 35 and 60 degrees north. And uh, and the reason we're like this, pale skins, is because we need to absorb all the sunshine we can get. Uh, I see. Whereas the African needs to block most of the sunshine he gets because he's in full sun exposure all the time, 12 hours a day. Right. So anyway, this group, um, it, it's it's full of controversy and unfortunately, um, opinions, well, opinions, I was thinking self-destructive. Uh, so what happened was somebody posted, I basically, we're sick. I'm sick. The group is full of people that are in agony all the time. Oh, yeah. And this person said, I am craving cigarettes um, I'm a, and so I assumed they were a smoker there was nothing to suggest that they weren't um, and I just said oh, something along the lines of, did it occur to you that maybe you're poisoning yourself and that might be one of the reasons why you're sick and I got um, a few nasty reply, <laughs> replies to my comment I actually spent a half an hour replying and unfortunately my, I, I you're Act of God it. or whatever, my iPad lost it. Like, I don't know. I thought I I did. I'm sure I hit post. Oh. And it, 
and it never got posted for having bad thoughts and yes so your subconscious pulls it on you i guess it i guess it was not wanting to be in a full scale war and uh, and then after spending half an hour writing it because i wanted to craft it very clearly i wasn't about to spend another half an hour doing the same thing over again so i didn't uh, well, but so let's talk but we never talked about we haven't i think maybe once five years ago or eight years ago, might have talked about smoking. But let's yeah. talk about these things that people want and feel cravings for. Did you ever smoke? No. I did. Oh, okay. Tell us a little bit about that. Are you smoking now? No. Okay. No. So what happened? Funny, funny thing. So until eight, age of 18, I was totally anti-smoking. Like I just looked down my nose on all the smokers. Mm. Then I became sexually active with a girl who smoked after. Uh -huh. And I would lay there next to her and uh, she would she would light up. And I'd say, well, let me try this. Maybe it's fun. The uh, previous part was. <laughs> and uh, before you know it, I was asking her for whole cigarettes. And before I knew it, I was buying my own. And that lasted until I was 24. I wasn't a heavy smoker, but I smoked. And um, and then I decided this is nonsense. That relationship didn't last. And, uh, and I decided, no, I'm just going to quit. And so I had a three-week period in which I decided to just go from however many I used to smoke to the last one. And on the last day before I went into jail now the jail the jail was when when i became an immigrant or refugee i should say when i asked for refugee status back in austria under the united nations plan the last day of my freedom was the last cigarette i lit and then we the turned last day of your freedom well the and first day when, of your well <laughs> yeah okay when I turned myself in to the authorities saying, I'm hereby applying under the United Nations status for refugees, um, that was the end of my smoking. I see. Yeah. And, and what happened in the next couple of weeks? Oh, we spent three weeks in quarantine. Um, they took my fingerprints and my pictures. <laughs> and and about the smoking. Oh, <laughs> like, well, I had no, oh, it's done. I just threw it away, no problem, right? There were no cigarettes. I was in jail. Oh, oh, you really were in jail. I was totally in jail. Oh, okay. I was in quarantine for three weeks. And so you were unable to have any cigarettes? Nothing. So you were you were balled up in the corner in a fetal position, sobbing? I wasn't so bad, no. You weren't so bad. But for some people, it's a real hard thing to do. Yes. And I mean, we don't want to be discompassionate. I mean, we don't want to say, well, this is obviously a very easy thing to do when it's not. Uh, but I think everything starts from the thinking of it, right? Like if you think, okay, why am I not as healthy as I should be? And I smoke and I drink a lot. And I threw coffee into the title. I, you know, <laughs> I'm not a coffee drinker and I'm not, not an alcoholic yeah. And I'm not a smoker. So, yeah. like, you should not be talking about this, Scott, because you don't understand this. Well, I have drunk stuff before, and yeah. and I tried to have coffee for two weeks when I was in my early 20s. just about killed me. <laughs> and and I and I sort of half had a puff. Well, I'll tell you. Okay, I'll tell you why I don't smoke. It's, very, uh, it's a very quick story. When I was three or four or five, one of my very earliest memories was on the farm visiting my uncle's. And one of my uncles, I'm looking up at him, and he's like this giant. And he's smoke. He's putting something in his mouth, and smoke is coming out of his mouth. Now, it was either a cigarette or a cigar, and I suspect that it was a cigar. And he looked at me, and he just said, here, Scott. And he gave it to me, and I went, and I just about died, turned green, everything else. And after that, I've had absolutely no inclination whatsoever to stick anything that burns in my mouth. Yeah. You know? But... Yeah. Having said that, you know, like some one person says, well, I'm sure you've got no bad habits, right? Like, no, I'm not a saint, but I, I do look at my life and I say, okay, you know, what parts of my life am I unhappy about? And one was actually a very dull pain about six months ago and before. And I thought, well, what can I do? And I talked to you and you said, well, um, 
you need more enzymes and you need to alkalize a little bit and everything else. And I said, okay, well, I've got this bottle of enzymes. How much should I take? And you said, well, until you get, you feel it. And I'm like, feel enzymes? Like, what are you talking about? Right. Yeah. So I'd have three or four and then I'd have three or four more. And then I had three or four more. And then about an hour later I go, Oh, that's what he meant. That's what he meant. So they go, oh, I feel like we don't know what feeling good is. And we think, Oh, it's high or something. No, no. It's like, Oh, I don't have all these pains, right? So, you know, you have to start thinking. I'm like, okay, I have the group is a fibromyalgia support group. I have fibromyalgia. What am I doing that's sabotaging my health? And when someone says, I'm smoking all the time, or I have a huge craving for smoking, I assume that means you are smoking. And then, it, and that doesn't mean that you're going to tomorrow stop. But hey, what if all the damage being done by the cigarettes contributes to the pain that you're in? That would be a logical assumption. I have this concept of pleasure and pain. And pleasure tends to be usually immediate. And pain oftentimes is not. Like the consequence is not always immediate. Right. Cancer is a great example of that, right? Yeah. 25 years to get from here to cancer um, on deficient the- iodine. How about this? That simple deficiency of iodine will get you prostate cancer in men or uterine or ovarian or breast cancer in women. And I'm, this is not a promise. This is a possibility. Right? Right. But who is going to start at age 25 supplementing with iodine just in case they might not get cancer when they're 50? Right. And that's the problem. Like there's nobody telling us that there are consequences, that it's going to go downhill. You like to talk about the hammer, right? So, I mean, you take the hammer, you miss the nail, you hit your thumb, it's sore, okay? Well, they're like that's pretty clear cause and effect, right? Yes. So I'm not going to do that, or I'm going to be careful, or more careful. I'm trying not going to do that again, whatever it is. But if you're smoking every day and, hey, this is the way I feel, I don't feel too bad, uh, or I feel the same as I did yesterday when I smoked, then there's no there's no immediate feedback, no immediate consequences of it. And so you go, hmm, uh, I guess I'm just going to continue doing it. I don't see the point in not doing it. Whereas if you had a puff of a cigarette and every time you did it, it burnt a hole in your tongue, and you got mm-hmm. scars there, and you were continually burning that same spot, and it hurt a lot, you would stop doing it. But here is the metaphor that really follows. So wheat is like this. Gluten, for probably 90% of people, is this kind of problem. Like in your gut, you have the villi. In the small intestine, you have the villi, and they sort of, let's just say that they look like this. Um, and when they get sicker, they shorten and shorten and shorten until they're like this. And uh, what happens is that in the gaps between them, the underdigested food can get into the bloodstream. Anyway, so here we are. On top of this, on, on top of the villi, there's a single cell layer that's a protective layer that a young person will heal or a healthy person. So I can eat a donut at lunch and by dinner, it has already healed itself. Or at least I eat whatever I eat, and overnight it, it, it will heal itself. Except as my repair capacity goes away, with age, it gets worse and worse. But with abuse, it goes quicker, right? Like it doesn't, yes. it, it, well, anyway, I lost mine, sorry to admit, at age about 62, when I could no longer eat wheat every day. By 63, I could no longer eat wheat, period. Anyway, so you could be 35 and get this. And what happens is you're no longer able to recover from it. So the next time you eat it, your immune system causes it to go into overdrive. So when you were talking about hitting the thumb with the hammer, there are these micro injuries hitting the gut with a tiny little hammer or hitting the liver with a tiny little hammer or hitting your joints from the inside with this tiny little hammer, the micro injury. And there are these millions of molecules causing these millions of little injuries. 
and your immune system is kept busy trying to fix all that. And when it's no longer able to keep up, you hurt. Okay, so bringing it back to to coffee. Coffee. (laughs) So coffee. Well, there are these four main metabolic types, I should say endocrine dominances. The um, adrenal dominant person can handle coffee, no problem. The thyroid dominant person should not drink coffee. I am the thyroid dominant. I do badly. I, it, it just is too much for me. I can't handle it. Uh, there, are, there are people who can take a coffee at any time of day and be fine. So you decide. If you're fine with it, carry on. It has antioxidants in it. So there is a level of protection, but it will strongly affect your pH balance. So if you're not doing other things that are balancing it, you're going to end up creating long-term problems. Because you're going to be acidic. Yes, which long-term acidity is cancer territory. Does the acid also um, like wear away at stuff? Like I, in my opinion, I'm thinking of joints. There, mm-hmm. that's not going to be an effect. Not Inflammation. Yeah, it, it is definitely related, but it's not directly. It's just so, so we have all these indirect things that are related to pain, yeah. and nobody wants to deal with any of them because they're because they can't see the hammer hitting their thumb. Right. There's no direct connection. So smoking, right? Yeah. Uh, well, to it, supplies, it supplies a nicotine, which is actually the same thing as niacin, which is the same thing as vitamin B3. So you can indeed supply vitamin B3 by smoking it. What the heck? It's nutritional supplementation. Hmm. Never mind the tar and what the other stuff is that happens with your lungs. I mean, if you are smoking cigars and the old style tobacco that is not treated with uh, all these things that cause cigarettes to keep burning. I, I forget there are hundreds of different chemicals that are added to cigarettes that shouldn't be, but are. So what you're saying is, is there's a difference between organic, unprocessed tobacco and what you're going to be getting in the store. Right. If you're smoking an ice Cuban cigar, that's one thing. Cigarette, not as healthy. Right. But of course, who can handle a a raw cigar? That thing is just such intensity, right? So what we're saying is, is if you're not well, smoking is not helping you. No, it's not helping you regardless. Okay. So the next step would be all right. I, what do I do about my cravings? Like, I'm, I mean, there's this victim mentality about, well, I, I smoke, but I can't, I can't, can't stop. stop. Yeah. What, you know, how do I stop? Or how do I do? So, and I think the okay. first thing is from desire, like deciding that you're actually going to do something about it. All right. Well, you cannot buy this in Canada, but you can buy it in the United States legally and not a problem. It's called DHEA. D-H-E-A. Oh, yeah. Dehydroepi... No. Good. So we don't need to know what, what they stand for. What does it do? It's the antidote to cortisol. There are cortisol and the HEA. The HEA is the natural precursor to all of the happy and, and hormones like um, estrogen, testosterone, and many others. It's the cholesterol pathway. Anyway, the HEA is the anti-stress hormone. So if you have a craving for a cigarette, take 15 to 20 milligrams of DHEA, craving goes away. Hmm. So that's up to a limit of maybe 400 milligrams of DHEA every day. And you'll be non-smoker in less than a week. Because you won't feel like you won't feel the craving for it. Right. The thing that the cigarette does for you is the de-stressing, right? It's a neurological effect that you use the cigarette for. You know, so person- what about people who use sugar or uh, 
power to de-stress, emotional eating. Uh, well, hmm. would they would do they get the same impact from the DHEA? Like I've never tried. The only way I know it is because I met the inventor of the method, and uh, he actually had a patent on it. But he he was eighty five years old ten years ago, so I don't know. There's probably nobody maintaining it now. Right. And uh, there it is. Just. You want to stop smoking? Get a bottle of DHEA, 25 mg's, and use it up. You'll be done. And that's not an expensive thing. It's like a twenty-dollar item. <sighs> I don't know about the sugar side. The sugar, the best antidote I know to sugar is to eat protein 12 hours before. So if you're sugar craving at eight in the evening, you should have eaten an, an omelet at uh, eight in the morning. Mm. Okay. Get, get your proteins and fats in. The, the people who crave sugar the most are the thyroid dominants like me or you. Yes. And so our cravings kick in in the evening. And they kick in because we have not fed the body well in the morning. Which means more protein in the morning. Right. Yes, sir. Not a bagel, not a toast, not a bowl of cereal. You'd be better off eating nothing, which is not the right thing. For a thyroid dominant, you should be actually eating some protein in the morning. Right. So something like zoatine would be good if I was uh, if I was in a rush or wanted Perfect. something. Perfect choice. Yep, a smoothie with protein powder in it, like the zoatine. Yes, sir. I'm going to go off on a slight tangent because I've been taking some, using a, making a smoothie of taking some kind of makes you feel like I'm doing a drug or something. I've been adding zoatine to, uh, to my smoothies. And, and of course it's the summer. So there's fresh strawberries and fresh um, raspberries and fresh blueberries. So I'll take four or five or six and pop it in and it just uh, makes it delicious. Totally. It's delightful. You described my breakfast. <laughs> Blueberries in a blender with some protein powder. Yeah, perfect. All right. So what would you say to people who have a health issue and are smokers? Well, um, health issue. I mean, if, if their main problem is stress, the cigarette is probably a de-stressor. So their immediate need, I would say, keep smoking. For the long term, well, you're threatening yourself with lung cancer, so maybe find other ways to de-stress yourself, which we know how. Here's, here's my de-stress. I take the CBD, and uh, it it's works. Oil. Yeah, CBD from hemp, and uh, it works equally well. It just takes the edge off you. So if you feel too frantic, too gotta, 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 or oh my God, oh my God, what the heck, right? That's the typical reason why you'd want to smoke, to calm yourself down, to center, to, to give yourself focus. Well, this will do all that. And it's an anti-inflammatory at the same time. So it will not only calm you down, it will also support your immune system to uh, heal yourself. Now what? There you go. So how do you deal with the, well, you already said the DHEA helps you deal with the cravings. Because it's a de-stressing uh, supplement. So the cravings are not a physical craving. Like if, I have never taken heroin or cocaine, but I understand that if you go into withdrawal with heroin, it's a pretty awful experience. And we're not talking, and so I have assumed, having had no personal experience with this, that getting off of cigarettes was as bad as getting off of heroin. And I'm starting to think maybe that's not the case. Maybe it's as bad as getting off sugar, which both you and I can relate to because, yeah. um, you know, when you're running around the house looking in every I'm open, cupboard, looking in every cupboard, yeah. And, uh, and you know it's not there because if it was there, it would be eaten already. Yeah, that's right. And so... I mean, that's one of the preventive methods, right? Just not have it around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you just go cold turkey and get try and get through that 10-minute or two-hour or three-day period where you just 
going nuts. Yeah, you're a little bitchy and a little whatever, but you get over it. You can. You need to think of yourself. You need to reinvent yourself as a not smoker, right? But of course, you cannot create a concept of a not. Like when I'm mm. asking you to not think of a purple shirt on a guy, how are you going to do it? So There's, the other part of this too is getting support from the people that are around you. So if you're a smoker and your significant other smokes, that's going to be a problem. Oh, yeah, that's tough. Sure. Well, what do you do? So you have a choice. You can, you can decide that both are going to go together or just don't make big deal of it. I mean, the f pain of fibromyalgia is much worse than not smoking. So I wouldn't make a big fuss over it. You feel like a cigarette? All right, have yourself. And then find another way to satisfy the craving for concentration. And I'm telling you, get CBD and you will not have these cravings. Or get DHEA and take it when you have the craving. It will go away. There are alternatives. The problem is that you're stressed and you're looking for a release. One of them is the breathing. If you can do that, you don't have to have a stick in your mouth to do it. And when you take a deep breath in and deep breath out, that's a relaxation response trigger. Mm -hmm. That happens naturally when they smoke. Yeah. <sighs> there, I, I just did it. Right. And it's totally handy. Absolutely. Deep breathing works. Sigh. Ah. Uh, uh, anyway. There you go. All right. Yeah. It's that simple, man. It's totally simple. Anybody can do it. Simple, but yeah, not easy. <laughs> not easy. Which reminds me of what another friend of mine once said, which is you can have uh, short-term pain for long-term gain, or you can have short-term gain for long-term pain. There we go. And you That's have, it. And you That's have, the button. You have to really decide which it is that you want to do. Um you can be happy for the next five minutes and miserable for the next th month, or you can be miserable for the next five minutes and happy for the next month. Yeah. And so, so it goes with the fibromyalgia, right? We have people who have been in pain for 20 years and they, they keep writing, I go to my doctor and he gives me a prescription for this and this and this and this and this, and, this, and I take it and it's not helping. Or it used to help, but it doesn't anymore. And they just keep doing the same thing. And they keep on just, oh, yeah, that's that's how we're going to get better. We're going to go to the doctor because doctor knows. Well, let me tell you, doctor doesn't know. Doctor knows how to set a broken arm. Doctor knows how to uh, uh, fix a um, infectious problem like if you get gonorrhea, definitely go see a doctor. They have tetracycline or something like that for it. But when you get a chronic inflammatory problem that took years to develop, none of the emergency techniques, emergency room techniques, are applicable in reversing the problem. You cannot poison yourself out of a problem created by too much toxicity. Anyway, so that's that's this uh, keep looking in the wrong place. Right. And also looking for the magic button. Yeah. The magic easy. pill, the easy button. Yeah, that this is called the silver bullet in the medical jargon. They always look for the silver bullet solution. This is the official policy. Number one, that there is a single diagnosis. Number two, that is a single cause associated with the diagnosis and number three that there is a silver bullet solution associated with this problem symptom problem diagnosis and the truth of the matter is is that you eat a variety of foods you drink a variety of liquids you breathe air that's different now than it was 10 minutes ago and uh, you're in a different place whether it's in the woods in the park in your house in an office in a car in a bus in a train in a plane 
on a, on the beach, on the ocean, you know, I mean, everything changes around you and all those changes we know has an effect on us. Right. Anyway, so there's the assembly of things, right? I associated with the trauma, traumatic experiences, emotional or physical, um, toxic load. The industrial age has brought upon us. And it's increasing with each generation. It's worse. That's why there's more of it now. And of course, we have we have started preserving every individual. This is probably the worst of it. Of course, this is not going to be politically correct, but here goes. Up until maybe two or 300 years ago, a typical woman would have a dozen of pregnancies and maybe three or four of them would grow up to be adults. The rest would just not reproduce for various reasons. They would succumb to illness, injury, and whatever. And so those that were genetically incompatible with the food resource available in their localized area would simply be weaker and they would not live. And so that's how you end up with this genetic adaptation to living in an Eskimo village or a tropical village in India or in, you know, if, if you are from Vanuatu, you have ready access to pork and to tropical plants. And as long as you live on the Vanuatu diet, having been born to Vanuatu parents, you're going to do just fine. But I cannot translate transplant you into a cold climate because you're not going to do well there. And I cannot transplant you into the diet of the Swiss village where you're going to be eating rye bread, aged cheese, and sauerkraut. Yeah, and I happen to know about Vanuatu, and unfortunately, they've been importing potato chips and Coca-Cola, and they have an obesity problem like nobody's off, business. Off the charts, yeah. Off the charts, yeah, because they're not eating what they normal what their normal diet was. It's just totally been right. uh, hijacked by our Western culture. And of course, now we have mixing of races, right? The uh, the Cherokee grandmother with the uh, Swedish grandfather mating with a um, half African somebody, whatever, right? Like it's it's everything. Yeah, it's so all it's, mixed up. It's all mixed. So you can no longer know because it's a mix. But there is a predictive method. It's called metabolic typing. And it lets you at least understand which foods and what blends, what mixes are going to work for you. So if you're thyroid dominant, you need to supplement with iodine because that's the gland that needs it the most, for example. And you need to eat a lot of protein and fat because that's your skinny food and your put on weight food are carbohydrates. Right. So if you're wondering like, okay, how do I, where do I even start? We have a seven day challenge. And if you're in the fibromyalgia group, if you look up at the banner, that's what it says, and it tells you where you can find day one. And if you're uh, if you're not in the group because you don't have fibromyalgia and you're listening, uh, look in the description below. We'll put a link to the uh, the we have a Udemy course on it as well. We'll put a link there. We'll give it to you free, and you can then. And what the challenge does is it just asks you to not eat a certain food for one day, and then see how you feel. Whether you feel more energetic, less energetic. Um, and and we're kind of tricking you because it's one food for for one day for for a sev seven different days seven different foods. We're so asking by you the do time the seventh day rolls in, you will have been without something for seven days. Yes, uh, but if you eat something, it's usually three days later that you really can tell. So, uh, but this is the beginning because some people, if particularly if you're extreme and you're with like let's say you have a problem with milk. And you have a really big problem with milk and you don't know it, then when you do the exercise of not having any dairy products for a day, we hope that you notice like, wow. And so at the end of the seven days, you look back at your journal and you say, well, the day I didn't have milk, I really felt a lot better. Try it without for three days and see how you feel. Try And then yeah. try it for a week, see how you feel and just yeah. continue. And then eventually you may say, you know what? Coconut milk is... Uh, it, just it's white and it's liquid and and I can't really tell the difference and I don't have the bad impact on my system that the uh, regular pasteurized home, home, homogenized milk has on me. Yep, I remember if I if I when I ate dairy, I would get post nasal drip, 
like the next morning I would wake up with a stuffy nose. Mm. And uh, a funny thing, so I switched to just organic yogurt, nothing else. I didn't get stuffy nose. But then my daughter challenged me and said, stop eating it for a week. On third day, my belly went away. Like I had uh -huh. this far and it went back like three inches. So bloating. Yeah, I was swollen. Yeah. So there you go. All right. So thank you very much for joining us, Martin. If somebody wanted to delve into these topics in more detail and more specifically, obviously we're taking very broad strokes here. We're being very global and everybody is very individual. Uh, you know, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, Life-enthusiast.com. Look it up. There's lots of information there. And the phone number is posted on the website. And it's 866-543-3388. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, everybody. This has been the Life Enthusiast Online Radio and TV Network, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.